Good evening, members of Spiritual Encrypted Encounters. I'm your host tonight, Sorry to see us. How's everybody doing this evening? I hope everybody is doing great. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a live uh, today, uh, replacing Brother Ape see us. Uh, and I want to share with you all some stories uh, of, of encounters that I witnessed while I served the United States Army. Uh, I served in Germany while I was with 135 Armor. And I served in the CAV for about eight years while I was stationed on Fort Hood, Texas. I was a CAV soldier. I was in 212 CAV, right across the 1st Cavalry Division in Fort Hood, Texas. Hope everybody is, is doing fine. Before I continue, you know, there's a lot of people that are trying to steal. That there's a lot of stolen batter out there going on right now. And I just want to show you that I'm the real deal. You know, I, I know you, some of y'all have me on your friends list. And you've seen some of the pictures that I shared with y'all. But I want to show y'all something, something that normally somebody doesn't have because it's something that we have to turn in when we leave. I did turn in one that I had, that I had, but I had lost one in the field. You know, when you're out there, you lose things, you lose wallets, you lose ID. So I had lost my ID, but when I came, when I got out of the military, I found an old ID I had lost. You know, it was mixed up with some of my gear. Uh, so I wanted to share with y'all, for for the viewers or whoever's going to view this video, that I am the real deal. So I'm going to show you an ID from back in the day of when you were in the military from 89 to 99. There was a certain ID that will give you. It was a, a greenish ID. And in, on the ID, it's got your name and it's got your rank and your social security number. So I'm not going to show the social security number and he, and he, and he's got the date of when you when your time is up so i'm going to show you that id right now so you know i'm the real deal let me see so we won't have no glare on it i'm getting glare from there you go that's that's me right there uh, let me let me get a better better close a better picture of it uh, Okay Wait up Is is a light that's giving it a glare so you're not able to see it right There you go That's me right there When I when I served the military Sergeant CS Sergeant E5 This is my ID, my old military ID. When I served, uh, served the United States Army, I wanted to share here with y'all on uh, spiritual encrypted encounters, so you can know that I'm the real deal. You know, even though that y'all seen some of my pictures, I'm trying to get the glare off. For some reason, there's a glare on here. Uh, I don't know where the glare is coming from. I don't even got the lights on in here, but I'm I'm getting a, a glare. But that's the, how the IDs used to look uh, back in the day. Uh, and the back of it, it's got uh, your birthday, it's got the weight, your height, your color of, of hair, your color of eyes, and it's got the date of issue when the the ID was issued, plus your blood type. But this ID of me when I was a sergeant in the United States Army. Another thing that they give you when you uh, when you leave the military and it's with you all the time is a DD-214. And like I said, there's a lot of people out there trying to claim they're Marines at the, the military and they're pretending to be somebody that they ain't, you know? So when you leave the military, it's a form that they give you is a DD-214 that, that you that you have on the DD-214 uh, it, it shows 
where you've been, in, where you've been. It's got your name. It's got everything. It's got everything where you've been in the military. Uh, the medals that you get, that you have, uh, and everything. And I'm going to show you right here. My DD-214 from the military. A quick glance of it, because what's on here is personal. Uh, right here, it, it, it states where I've been. It, it, it's got the date when I joined the military. It's called a DD-214, and it's got all your information in there of when you serve in the military. Uh, and you know, and of course, uh, it's when you leave the military, you get you're, you're discharged. It's because you served your time. When you re-enlist, you, they discharge you also temporarily till you just temporarily discharge so that so they can you can you can raise your hand again and do the oath. Uh, for people who don't understand that, uh, you have to raise your hand again every time you um, every time you re-enlist, you have to raise your hand to repeat the oath of the flag. Uh, so the DD D14, it's got your name, it's got uh, what company you're in, how, what, what company you're in, it's got the times and dates of when you joined the military, when you separated from the military, uh, and, it's, and, it, and it also has got a, a place here where it's got all your medals that was given to you in the military. Uh, and here it is right here, uh, DD214, to let you know that I am a army veteran I've done showed you all my ID my ID right here when I was in the army right there also what I got when you leave the military and if you're injured right that you have to go through the VA system they give you an ID so here's my ID you see the United States flag? It's got VA. This is my ID from the uh, from the from the VA that I'm a, a disabled veteran that I serve my country and I have some injuries, so I'm enlisted within the VA facility. The only way you can receive something like this is if you serve the United States Army. You're wondering why Sergeant C is showing in this. We don't want to know all this. I'm showing you this right now, where we're reviewing, because there is a lot of people out there pretending to be that they serve the military, pretending to be that they did this and they did that, but they're pretenders because if you don't have this kind of identification that I'm showing you, and they don't have a DD-214, a, a VA card, or if they are uh, veterans, uh, they have a blue ID, they serve all the 20 years, they should be able to, to show that to you of where they've been. And there I also have uh, my, my uh, words from the military where I have ARCOMs and all kinds of stuff when I served uh, in Germany and in Fort Hood, you know. I just wanted to show that to y'all. Like I said, there's this people out there that's trying to steal our valor of what when we placed our, our, our lives on the lines. So they just don't steal that. They also want to steal your stories. They want to twist stuff around, make it seem like uh, Sergeant Sias is out to uh, going after people here in the United States of America. Uh, the only thing that I was taught is where we go, we're first to go. First to go, which means the first to go means you're the first boots on the ground to a certain location when you go to uh, when you're, you're called upon to go fight a an enemy, right? So when you go out there, you know uh, you're the first one to hit the ground. You're the the advanced party, the first to go. You know, being a tanker is one of those jobs that when you enlist as a tanker, or whether it be infantry or scout you know you're going to be in the front lines that that's our duty to fight you know so they train us very highly uh, on the offensive and they train us defensive they train us all, all kinds of way and we train we train we train training is something that we do constantly like i remember when i first come to to the cav in which i have my cat 
of the calf. I was, I was in the calf for a lot of years. I think I have a pendant here where I got the calf right there, the calf. Uh, I was in the calf for nine years. The first two years that I was in the calf, we would spend 10 months of training out in the field, whether it was training here, training in Fort Owen, California. I think at one time the rotations were twice a year. We had to go to Fort Owen to train and we'd do several gunneries. You know, the, the, the army had the money or the government had the money for us to train that way. Uh, and what's happened sometimes when there's a change of presidency, there's other two th things that are going to happen. Depends if it's a, when it's a Republican or Democrat, in which I served under both. Uh, one of them, when it's a Republican, uh, the, what happens is the military is going to upgrade. When it's a Democrat that becomes president, what happens is the, the, mili the military downsizes where there's a democratic president they start downsizing and there's not that many field problems and stuff like that because they're trying to save money so that's what normally happens when there there's that kind of effect of uh, pre different presidents uh, so what i wanted to talk to you about today now now that i introduced myself to you sarn uh let me do a little bit of a uh, moral introduction I served the government from 1989 to all the way to 1999. Um, my first my basic training was in Fort Knox, Kentucky. I was over there in this, uh, this the barracks were called Disney barracks. So that was my, where I went to go train, my uh, basic training in AIT was in Fort Knox, Kentucky. From Fort Knox, Kentucky, I went to Germany. I was stationed in Erlangen, Germany. From Erlangen, in Germany, I went to Operation Desert Storm, where I was in the battle of Medina Ridge, and we fought the Medina Republican Guard. When they, uh, when they, uh, how should I say, uh, when I when I was on leave and went back to Germany, they closed the base, so they had to relocate me. So they sent me to Fort, uh, Fort Hood, which was here in Texas, Fort Hood, in which that's why, why, uh, why I uh, served eight years. And I got out, honorable discharge in 99. I did all the time that I was going to do. I wish I could have done more, but due to injuries from the military, uh, I couldn't perform my job duties anymore because, you know, I gave it 100%. And when you give it 100%, where you're training or you're in battle or in combat, injuries happen. So I had to get out because I couldn't perform my duties as a M Abrams M1 tanker. So now that I properly introduced myself as Sergeant Cias, I'm not, uh, that was then, I'm not, but I'm always going to be a sergeant because of my paperwork. That's why I left as. So I'm always going to be a sergeant. I wish I could have climbed the ladder higher, uh, but I, I couldn't due to the ailments that I had. You know, I couldn't uh, get promoted because I was sick. So I, you know, when they give you, we call it a dead man's profile, where you can't do nothing because of the condition you have, then you can't do nothing. You know, the, you have to follow the doctor's orders and the people in power, whether the sergeant major, the first sergeant, with that profile. They can make you do nothing because they can't use you. So that's why I left the military. I only served 10 years in the military. Uh, but it wouldn't be for the injuries that I had, I would have stayed in longer. I was I was kind of like, you could say hardcore. I love the, the military. I love going to the field, I love training. So now we're going to talk about some stories. I would say I would, I would have to go in order of the stories from... Well, I went to certain things. Uh, See, so basic training, I really didn't notice nothing because it was nothing but training and training. Uh, uh, I think the first time I went to something uh, was in Germany. In Germany, the woods are very dense, very thick. There is nature trail walks where the Germans walk 
and for exercise you know that's one thing they do they do a lot of exercise over there you know and you know of course they drink a lot of beer also so i don't know <laughs> if the exercise is going to help them that much as much beer they drink and the beer over there in germany has a lot of yeast in which it, it can get you bloated pretty bad if you you're drinking daily the the yeast within the beer can get you bloated so but there is a lot of people there that they do work out and, and look in pretty good shape you know uh the first thing that i witnessed ever witnessed was was out there in germany was when i used to go running you know uh i was i lived in the billets and i would go running 20 miles over 20 miles a day with the pt and everything all together was 20 miles at nighttime i go run 10 miles so i remember running and i went to a certain location when I was in, uh, running and I stopped and I had a blindfold with me because I wanted to train my senses. So as I went into, into the wood line, you know, I'm out there, there's nobody around me, just nothing but woods. I put on a blindfold, it's already dark, you know, we're training in the dark. You know, have you heard the term, uh, don't fear the dark? Well, I would train in the dark, you know, because I felt if I train in the dark, it's gonna make my senses more keen right which what i mean by that is my senses are going to be like real good that i'll be able to sense my hearing will be uh, real good my senses of seeing is going to be good my senses of feeling spiritually is going to be good so i would train with a blindfold and i would sense the energy around me you know when i was in germany i was practiced with the uh, immovable objects which was trees you know I, I know some martial arts so i would train with the trees practice with the trees i will hit i will hit immovable objects uh numerous times i'm talking about a lot of times with my palms my fist to get stronger you know uh to be able to just like i could uh send energy out i could absorb energy if a punch would come my way I could absorb that energy and let that energy go out of me. Well, that's what I would train and, uh, before I went out in combat. So there was one evening where I was practicing with this big tree. You know, they're, they're, they're tall in Germany. They're not too thick, but they're pretty tall. So I was banging on the tree with the energy, using my power. And next thing you know, I hit it and with some energy that the tree fell. The tree literally fell with an energy blast when I hit it. It fell to the ground. And I was looking in my hands, you know, it's like I would train every every day. You know, every night I would train. So when I seen that, it's like, whoa, that's some power, you know, some power of of training the what, what I was doing. It, it was it was making my senses and my spiritual abilities that greater, you know. So when the tree landed, I was just looking at my hands, you know, because of what happened. That was the first time I ever witnessed the power that was within me. Uh, next thing you know, what happened is when that tree fell, from a distance, I hear trees falling. Boom. Boom. And I'm looking. And as I'm looking, I start seeing the trees that are coming closer and closer to the darkness where they're falling. Like something's coming my way. So as many trees as that fell, whatever that was, it must have been something that was territorial. And I don't think it was a wild boar. It was something that roamed that land. Uh, I didn't want to know what it was that was coming my way. So I decided to leave the area in which I did. I left the area because I didn't know, I didn't want to know what, what was knocking all those trees down coming my way, you know? People believe in Bigfoots, people believe in Dogman or Lycanthorpe, werewolves, whatever it was, had enough strength to keep on knocking trees down. And I never found out what it was that was coming away because I left the area. I felt, yeah, I knocked one tree with my, my training, but whatever is coming my way is knocking down a bunch of trees. So I left the area and I didn't wait there to see what was coming my way. So I left the area. That was like one of the weirdest experiences 
that I had and I was only 19 years old, you know. I want to share the experiences that I had in Germany first before I continue. Uh, so I, I had like a question mark in my head, like what was it that was coming my way, you know. And I'm glad I didn't stay because, you know, I was 19. When you're 19 years old, you're vulnerable to anything, especially if you have spiritual openings. So whatever was coming my way, it was getting me to believe by knocking the trees that it was something, you know. I just didn't want to stay there to see what it was. So, but I still continued to train, but I stopped training in the woods. After that incident, I've, st I've stopped going training in the woods and I will train just within the base because like I said before, I don't know what was in that. I'm in a foreign country and I don't know about the area. So whatever it was that was coming away, you know, it was, it was something that had, uh, that was very strong that was knocking down trees. So the, the other incident I had there while I was stationed in uh, Germany, you know, is, is dealing with the billets. When I stayed in the billets, I did uh, Sister Veronica, Brother Christopher Thomas, Sister Nellie Turner, cousin Do uh, Domingo Sias. The second incident that I happened in Germany was, it was, it was like a uh, occurring, uh, occurring incident. But what happened was, I was always, when I would go to sleep in my room, you know, this, we were living in G German billets, uh, uh, German soldier billets. So, what I would hear at nighttime is the, 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 the doors that we had were made out of steel. So, what I, what I would, the, the door store rooms were made out of steel. So, what I would hear was high heels walking up the stairs and then i would hear the high, high heels walk into the hallway we had a long hallway and then it would the high heels walk into my room so as i would hear the high heels walking towards me then all of a sudden i feel like i'm being choked out by something so it's choking me out and i wake up and by the time i go to reach the light because the rooms were pretty big I would look, there's nothing there. So that was happening to me daily there uh, in, in the German uh, in Ferris Barracks. So that was one evening where, you know, this was happening daily. I was getting tired of being uh, spiritually attacked by this ghost that wouldn't identify itself. Um, as far as I knew, I would just hear high heels or what else can make a noise that sounds like a high heel? Hoofs, right? Hoofs. Hoofs, hoofs like of an animal, like a deer or a, uh, a goat, because it sounded like high heels to me, you know. Uh, so then one, one day, the same, same thing happened to me. I heard the, the same routine. We were in the third floor. I heard the heels walking up the, the, the stairs into our, the hallway. I heard the doors open of the main entrance of the hallway. Then I heard the heels walking down the hallway. And then I hear him coming to my room and I start getting choked out. Started getting choked out. I get up. I turn on the light. There's nobody there. So I'm, I went out, out into the hallway to look. The, there was nobody in the hallway. The only thing that was in the hallway was the CQ and the, the, and, the, and the runner, which the CQ were normally NCOs. And those are the ones that, are, that, that answer the phones and, and, and stuff like that when... They come, they have to do some checks. So they were sitting there, but there was no, and I asked them, hey, was there a female in here or something? They said, nobody's been in here, you know? So I went back into my room and want to go lay down. As I'm laying down, I hear a door knock. Uh, somebody's knocking on my door and I go answer it. And it's a friend of mine that had borrowed a movie, right? So as I'm in the hallway and it's giving the movie, is you know back then the movies are vhs <laughs> he asked me say hey i came to give you this movie earlier but when i came to give you i heard some high heels in your room you had a female over you know he was like all excited thinking i had a female over in the room with me i said no i said well how do you know uh it was uh, a woman is because i heard the high heels in there so then right, right there i knew 
that it was a some kind of ghost or something of that nature that uh, I would say it would be a uh, that or something demonic I mean something was coming choking me out uh, so that kind of like stopped a little bit because I, I, I got some uh, some holy water and uh, put a cross on my door and a cross in the on the windows uh, so so nothing will be able to come in uh, that was just one of the stories that happened to me in the billets. Uh, another one was there was th three, st four story. I would say one, two, four story, three stories. On the fourth floor, there was an attic, and the attic is where our training rooms were, where there was there were classrooms. So every time I would go and train up there in the attic, it always felt like to me like if something was staring at me you know so something was looking at me i couldn't pay attention stay focused in class because it felt like somebody was looking at me from a doorway that goes further in where there's no rooms but is the attic right i always had the the presence of some something looking at me so every time i go to that classroom i always felt that something looking at me well when when we were deactivating our unit, they deactivated, that's the word I was looking for earlier. They deactivated our unit. They put me in a detail to, to go and take all the wood off the, 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 the hallways and to paint all the rooms and go to the attic and paint the attic, right? So I was up there by myself painting the attic, not thinking about what had happened to me before, how I felt something was looking at me. So I finished paint, painting that, that classroom, the attic, all that location, I painted it. And I was tired, you know. So I sat down on the, the gallon of paint, the, the five gallon jug of paint. I sat on it and I kind of dozed off on it. You know, I dozed, I dozed off on, on the five gallon paint, paint can or, you know, it was a white one, pretty big. So... When I woke up from my siesta, from my nap, I witnessed painting in between my legs. I could see the white paint in between my legs. And when I looked down, what I witnessed was the number 666 six, six in between my legs. And I'm looking around and there's nobody there. So what I do, because I had some seals that told me whenever I, I, I finish to lock the door, put the padlock and put a seal on the door. Right. How you doing, Sister Katie? How you doing? So I went down there. I was upset because somebody had I seen the number 666 in between my legs on the on the on the concrete. So I locked it up, put the seal and ran to the other billets where we were staying because they moved us to another billet across across that one i was in the first floor, first floor on that one so i want to go talk to the first sergeant I'm like hey man who played the prank on me was it you who'd you send to play this prank he's like what are you talking about i let everybody off at like four o'clock i said and i told him what happened i said no nobody played no prank on you he said everybody's gone already you know everybody's gone for the day so, so I left it at that, you know, and I, in my mind, I was like, well, somebody had to play that prank. But what was weird about it, that those sixes that was placed within my legs on the concrete were perfect, every single one of them. And they were facing my direction, the sixes, my direction. So I left it at that. That evening, uh, I was on the first floor where I painted was, I could see the building and it, that was up there in the attic, right? So I was waiting for, for, I had ordered a pizza from the pizzeria and I was waiting, waiting because normally what they do, since it's the first floor, they will come to the window, you know, to my window and that's where they would deliver the pizza, whatever I ordered. So I was waiting for the pizza guy to come. So as I'm waiting there by my window, it's dark already, it's nighttime. I'm waiting by the window. What I witnessed was this. There was a light to turn up in the attic where I painted it turned it, the light turned on in that that the floor and then you see 
the silhouette, the figure of somebody go stand by their window, a dark shadow, and is looking at me, and is and and is looking at me, and I'm looking at it, and we're making contact, and all of a sudden, just like in the blink of an eye, the light just shuts off. So, following day, now I'm in getting goosebumps just by talking about it. Uh, the following day, I tell the uh, I tell the my first sergeant, hey, I think somebody broke into the into the billets over there because I seen somebody up there in the attic. You know, that's what I told them. So we went to go investigate. The, the seal was still intact, the locker was intact, and I'm trying to figure out how they got in there. So we went in there, we looked in every floor, every room, and I said, maybe they're getting, from, getting in from the bottom. So when we did the, the investigation, we didn't find any way that anybody could have gotten in there. So I believe the ghost finally showed his presence to me, letting me know that it was it that placed the number 666 in between my legs. And I believe whatever that was there was the spirit probably of a dead German soldier, you know, that did that, playing, playing ghost games with me. Um, there was an experience that I had there. I'm talking about ghosts right now. You know, I talked about something that I, from the woods. Uh, there's another encounter I had, and I've talked to it before, but I'm gonna share it again. I'm sharing all the encounters that, uh, that happened to me when I was in Germany. There was an encounter where I was at a German bar called B-15s. Me and my friend Tony Melendez used to go there all the time. How are you doing, brother Christopher Thomas? Uh, it was called B-15s, and you know, it was already late at night. It was like 1.30, he's fixing the clothes. And you know, I, I was talking to this uh, German female. She kind of looked like a model. So we were just talking, and then we started walking side by side. You know, I was going to the billets, and and she, she had her bicycle, but she wasn't riding it. She could have rid it. Uh, drove on it you know rode the bicycle but she was just talking to me so we we're talking and then she said hey i know the the billets is still far away do you want to come with me into to my house you know do you want to come you can sleep sleep over there if you want to i know it's, it's late and i said okay so i go to her, her house i go in the, in, in her house and she's got a, a couch so i want to go and lay down on the couch and she went into into her room as she went into her room, and I'm laying on the couch, fixing to go to sleep. She tells me I can go lay down in the bed. So I go in the in, in, in her in her bedroom, and I got all my clothes on. But when I look at her, she don't have no clothes on. But in Germany, you know, when you make friends, uh, there it's, I guess it's customary that women over there. It's not like in the United States. Over there. Uh, being nude is is not a bad thing like over here where they'll take you to jail if if they see you nude you know you see a lot of nudeness over there even at the when you go to the the swimming pools like it's got a, the swim uh it's got a certain ger german name uh where you go swimming sometimes the females get a, a dress right in front of you so that's normal to them so i figured that was normal so i was tired and i fell asleep so when I woke up, I looked to my right, and she wasn't there by me. So when I looked towards the door, I could see the door open, and I could see somebody sitting in this style right there by the doorway. As they're sitting in this style, they have, you know, those mirrors where you can look at yourself that are on the wall where you, when you're getting dressed. Well, that had been broken, and they, were, they had a piece of glass, a sharp glass, I'm talking about a big old long piece of glass, and it's banging it, they're banging it on the wooden floor, and, and blood is coming out of their hand. I'm witnessing this, and I'm, you know, I was only 19 years old at the time. How you doing, Sister Bettina Masso? I said, noticing the blood coming up uh, the, the female's hand, when I'm looking at her, it's not the same person that I met at the bar. It's a whole completely different person. It's a, she's like an old lady, naked old lady, right there, sitting in the style, hitting the piece of glass, blood dripping. She's blocking the door, 
and her eyes are all back white. She's chanting something. I don't even know what she's saying, you know. So I'm, I'm witnessing this, and it, she kind of looked like she was possessed. Well, she was possessed. If her eyes were rolled back white, so yeah, she's banging the sharp object, the sharp piece of mir uh, mirror on the ground. I go slowly around her. You know, I'm only 19, so I go to the door that I entered. And she's got like six or seven, eight locks on it. <laughs> so I'm taking one at a time and looking. And she's got those little chains connected to them. And I'm looking and trying to take them out and looking to make sure she don't try to uh, charge me, you know, with, with a piece of glass that she has. So I'm looking and, and unlocking, looking and unlocking. And I opened the door. I didn't even close the door. I took off running, you know, because... Of what I witnessed, you know, so I was running. I was a fast runner, you know. I was a long distance runner, so I was I was running full full <coughs> full speed back to the billets. You could say that that freaked me out so bad that I literally jumped the wall. You you got main gates where you enter and you show your ID. I bypassed that. I went to the closest wall. There was to our billets and I jumped over it like a, I literally jumped over it. That's how much adrenaline rush I had from what I witnessed, you know, and, and I'm sharing this story with y'all. It went from a, a girl that seemed like she was like 20, 21 to an old lady that looked like she was like 65 or 70 years old or wrinkled. And she had told me she was a gypsy, <laughs> you see? So to me, I believe it was a gypsy which uh that i that i went that that i encountered there in in germany the the other story that i have uh of germany i'm sharing my encounters with y'all was the encounter of the man with an umbrella and and a and a, and a, and a long jacket it was cold i was gonna go go to the bar and when I opened the door, it was the same routine. You could see just smoke come out of the bar. It was a bar called Cheers I would go to. And smoke just came out of it. And I said, you know what? I don't, I don't, I don't want to, you know, when you, when you go to the bar, you, you know, you're going to drink and you might wake up with a hammer. I said, I don't want to deal with a hangover. So I said, you know what? I'm going back to the billets. I'm going to save my money and I'm going to go buy me, a, buy me a, some food and watch a movie. So when the door closed and I turned around, there was somebody standing behind me and it was a man with a, uh, a coat and he had an umbrella and he was looking at me and uh, he told me that he knew me with, he had a different accent from over there. And it's like, I asked him, how do you know me? And he said, I know, I know you, I know you because I know your family members. I know where you're from. That's what he told me. And he had a different accent. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm 19. I'm like, there's no way this guy knows who I am. So out of curiosity, I asked him. How you doing, Sister Bettina Moss? Uh, I asked him, if you know me, what's my name? You know, in the military, we, we're normally called by our last name, which would be C.S. That's how people know you by your last name. This guy said my full name and it kind of freaked me out so i'm freaking out a little bit you know like whoa how does he know my full name and then he said i know where you're from i know all your your family members and he's talking to me with a different accent i never met this man in my life right so i asked him so if you know where i'm from where am i from he said my hometown then I asked him, how many brothers and sisters I have? He said, how many brothers and sisters I had? I asked him some key questions. I asked him, what is my grandfather's name? He said, my grandfather's name. He said, my grandfather, uh, my, my grandmother's first name, middle name, and last name. And I said, okay, what's my parents' name and my brothers and sisters' names? He knew everybody, everybody. He wasn't looking, he knew everybody. 
And at that time, I was like, what am I dealing with? You know, what, know, what knows everybody in my family? There was only two things at that time that I could think of that would know everybody in my family. One would be Jesus Christ, so something angelic. And the other would be something demonic, right? So I didn't say nothing more to that uh, an individual. What I did is I left because I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't want to know what it was. So I left it alone and went back to the billets. The following week, I went back to the, to the same bar, but this time I did go inside the bar. I went there, had me a couple of drinks, and I stepped out of the bar. When I stepped out of the bar, you know, I wanted to get a jump start to make, to walk back to the, to the billet. So I went out of, got out of the bar. When I stepped out of the bar, I noticed something. I noticed this woman walking through the park. It's a, it was a big park. And across the park, there's uh, apartment complexes. This woman is walking in a white lingerie and it's just getting closer and closer to me you could see right through it and I'm like what's going on here you know so she comes straight to me and stand, stands right in front of me she's barefooted her face is pale and I'm thinking it's a ghost or something else she, she asked me come with me She's persuading me to go with her. Go follow me over here. Let's come over here. She pointed to a room where there you could see a light of a, of a lamp on. She's trying to persuade me to go with her. And I go, I always go with my gut. Is it how you doing, uh, Sister Renee Bush Anderson? It's like I always go with my gut instinct. My gut instinct said, don't go. You know, I was young, but I was the type of person that I would think I would follow my heart, follow my spirit. I never thought uh, in a bad way, you know, that like a lot of guys think with the wrong head. You ever heard that term? Me, I'm in a foreign country. I already, I already had a couple of bad experiences. So I said, you know, she was in front of me trying to get me to go with her. And I told her, no. I said, I told her, uh, just find yourself another GI there's a lot of GIs in there if they want to go with you they can go with you but I don't want to go with you so she said no I don't want them I want you and I said no and I walked away from her you know I walked away from her but when I look at at the picture of what happened within two week time frame you know I had a man with a with a hat and an umbrella with a coat then I had this female that was coming barefooted with his lingerie and her fa face looked pale. The only other thing that I could think of besides something angelic or something demon that might know you or your family members would be a Nosferatu, a vampire. That's what I think I might have been dealing with was a vampire, a Nosferatu. The Nasfuratu was the male that knew everything about me. And the the female that was coming was to lure me in. But they knew, they knew who I was. And I guess they was trying to lure me to go up there to set me up. But I didn't go. Um, that's well, one, uh, one of the stories that happened to me there in Germany. Uh, the other story, uh, there's a, numerous other things that happened to me there in Germany, but I'm trying to stay with a uh, ghost, Lycanthorpe, werewolf, dogman, so I'm going to stick to that. So now fast forward to when they deactivated the unit, I got sent to Fort Hood, and I'm in Fort Hood. I'm going to share some stories with y'all. When I went to Fort Hood, before I even went to the field, well, I had ever been to the field, uh, but I hadn't really experienced nothing. I was in a room, 
of the billets where I was on the first floor and in the middle of the room of the of the building <coughs> there's a quad where people could smoke in this gravel so I was on the first floor and every night I could hear a shovel like somebody's digging with a shovel and when I look I could see a shadow like somebody's right there outside my, my window digging with a shovel so when I open it I couldn't see nobody right so it's like it was a constant thing where I could hear the shovel boom boom something digging 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 it happened so many times that I didn't want to be there no more because I could feel the a presence of this ghost you know normally when you hear a shovel it's either somebody's dead there or there might be a hidden treasure you know four hood if y'all know four, four hood used to be in, in the back in the day with the horse horse regiments there was natives and stuff like that that worked with the calf but I couldn't take it no more there so I requested to move me from out of that room because of the the the, sh the, the noise of the shovel I were here every night so they moved me to a different room this room was on the third floor you know I was a I was an NCO at the time so they moved me to a third floor I'm in the third floor and that room where I used to stay at and it's in the opposite side of that location so I'm in a different building but it's the opposite from where I was at so what I was hearing over there where they moved to would be kids children two three in the morning I could hear them running up and down the stairs they were run, they were run to my to my door they were knock on the door and when I opened the door there would be nobody there you know imagine that hearing little kids playing you hear them running and when they enter the the best uh, the best of you right because it's four rooms and we had to keep the, the best of you uh, buffed when they go in there and they're, they're laughing it's echoing in there because you know it's a door that's closed so you could hear them laughing loud and then they come bang on my door and I'll open it but there'll be nobody there look my hairs are standing up just talking about this right now brothers and sisters y'all can see that uh, so it continued so then one evening the same children that I thought were children I heard them right across me on the third floor or in a different room laughing through a window and I was looking through my window and they were laughing from the opposite window they were laughing at me so I got I got upset I said oh so those are where the children are coming from they're coming from that building right there from the opposite of me so I went walk <laughs> walk downstairs this is in the middle of the night 2 to 30 I walk downstairs go to that building to the third floor and I'll go knock on that on that on that door where they were laughing from so I'm banging on the door banging on the door and it's like hey open up the door you know I'm banging on it boom 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 then the door next to me opens up and the guy that's there is like hey, he's, uh, the soldier says hey who are you looking for so well, I'm looking for the person that lives in here because of the kids in there they've been messing with me they've been going over there banging on my door and they're laughing out the window making fun of me so I was banging the door so he's like hey there's nobody there nobody lives there it's an empty room <laughs> this, this is what he said it's an empty room so I kind of like freaked out with that you know so I went back to my room closed the door it's like around 3 3 30 in the morning and I go lay down so I'm laying down laying down in my room and what I witnessed was this as I'm laying down in my bed I open my eyes I'm, do I'm dozing off as I open my eyes I witnessed what I believe was a Nosferatu in bat form it was real tall the, the, the way the face looked like a bat a giant bat but it was standing in front of my bed you know or you know whether it was a Nosferatu or something demonic you know demons have wings also 
So it was standing in front of my freaking uh, bed looking at me. So when I snapped out, I, was, I, I said, I rebuke you. When I saw rebuke, it was gone. But it was huge. It was dark black. And it was looking at me. So then I requested to see if they could get me out, out, out of there. What I did is they wouldn't get, move me to another place. So I was an NCO already. So I, I requested to move off base. So that's when I left the billets. That was just within the billets, the activity that was happening there in the billets. Uh, I'm going to share some stories with you all of uh, when I was in the field. Uh, when I was in the field, I was something that we witnessed. Me and my, my, my crew were going to go, go elu evaluate, uh, evaluate it. So it was, I was a gunner, my TC, and uh, two of my so the loader and, the, and the, the driver, we were walking up to get our scores for night fire. As we were, you know, when we were walking in the darkness, you know, we have the chem lights, we're walking in the darkness. I could smell like, a certain smell like of an animal around us. But I didn't think nothing of it, you know. So I just kept on walking and walking. And as before we got to the location where where they would give us our scores, you know, the evaluators were, we witnessed something. And what we witnessed was two werewolves. You know, at that time I didn't know nothing about Donbass. I said werewolves, like in Thorpe, standing by the edge of the wool line, they were pretty massive, and they were looking at us. I looked at my TC tank commander, and he looked at me, and I said to him, did you see that? He said, yeah, I see that. And when we turned back, they were gone. Then we looked at each other, and he, this is what he said. He said, sometimes it's just better to leave Mother Nature alone. It's not for us to know what that was. So we still had to go get our evaluation or score for our night fire. But they were pretty big. Uh, those in a, it's kind of, they were just looking at us, you know, just watching us from the tree line. They were brown, color brown, the one we witnessed. This was in Blackwell, Multi Blackwell Multi-Use Range in Clabber Creek. I mean, uh, in Fort Hood, Texas, Blackwell Multi-Range. It's like, where we'd go do our tank table, our, our gunneries. That's what we go do on that range. Witness that on that range, uh, which was whatever it seemed, uh, this werewolf-like creature sometimes, we were out there in gunnery uh, because our, our tanks have thermals and we have different filters where we can see different kinds of different thermal imagery. So what will happen is when we do gunneries and we have the thermal looking through our night sights, if we see cattle down range, we're supposed to call a ceasefire because those cattle do not belong to the government. But that's not what we witnessed. What we witnessed, me and my tank commander through our thermal sights, what we witnessed was seemed to be somebody walking into his down range. But the weird part about it was that we could not catch them to thermal. Thermal will let you know if it's something that's, that is a living creature, a creature because it'll have heat coming out of it. Well, whatever was done range didn't have no heat coming out of it, but you could see it moving down range. Uh, we call range control. They want to go investigate. They didn't find nothing. They came back. They said, okay. And we had a temporary ceasefire to the clear the range. Once they cleared the range, that which there was nothing there, then we went back to to live fire. So we would see a lot of that on the ranges of whether it was Blackwell, Trapnell, or Clamber Creek. A lot of people during gunneries or or, or training, we would see this kind of things out there on Fort on Fort Hood or the, on our training grounds. What was seen to be something out there, but our thermals couldn't catch it, but they would still be able to move. It's kind of, kind of like a dark silhouette. And you, you know, th there are capabilities we can see if it's something, something that's got, that's alive, that's got heat, 
like uh, you, you, we can see a cow, it'll show the heat coming out of the cow. I've seen the rats running around the field, the mice, and they have a, a heat thing. Uh, I've seen uh, wolves out there with a heat signature. I've seen foxes, raccoons, you name it, horses out there. Uh, I can't even see when the people go from range control down to the range to uh, change, uh, to service the generators that pop up the targets. I could see the heat, heat signature coming off of them. But whatever was out there had no heat signature. What could it be? Could it be uh, something that's dead? Like the Nasuratu? Or could it be something that has a cloak that the thermal imagery cannot capture what it was, but we could still see its shadow? You know, so there's many questions about that. What possibly could have been down out there that has that has a form, but there's no hit signature. Uh, I know there was a lot of Fort Hood is was a, a lot of native land where they have a certain area that's near in between the ranges that the soldiers are not allowed to go there. They're not allowed to go there because that area is in native native burial ground and we're not allowed to go up there you know so maybe a lot of the activity that's happening with the ranges has to do with the indian burial ground you know and possible all that area of, of fort hood and killeen areas uh that activity exists there where native uh indian burial grounds are there and and the city built over them in which that's why there's a lot of activity there you know, I believe uh, Killeen, Texas is one of the worst uh, 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 places to live where people die. I believe they, for, for Hood, so many killings of Fort Hood of soldiers being killed that they changed their name to Fort Cavazos. Could the Indian burial grounds so or the, the spirit of the native people that live there or causing this accidents to ha incident accidents to happen, or the, are they entering the people and causing entering the uh, possessing people to kill? A lot of accidents also that happen out there, and I believe that act that activity that I will see that I witnessed out there, I could sense it out there and and clean also. Uh, Another another thing that I witnessed when I was out there was when me and my driver, we was coming from, from the range. We didn't want to spend the weekend out there guarding one tank. So I said, you know what? We're going back to the rear, parking the tank in the mortar pool, and we're, we're, we're going to enjoy our weekend. So as we're diving, uh, driving down the tank trail, we're driving the, down the tank trail, uh, we have the thermals on. It's nighttime. I'm looking through the sights. He's looking through his. The driver has thermal also. Uh, Four hood. After you cro cross the the cow, the cow. Uh, what do you call them? There's a certain section that's got like steel, and it's for the cows, the cow guards. Once you cross that, you have to do blackout. So we're doing blackout. We're going blackout, coming back from the field. Uh, that's when we had our thermals on, and we're, we're driving, all of a sudden, from the left side of the path of the tank trail, we see something that's pixelated, that's pixelating into different colors, and it's kind of, it's got a short, like something is not working, that's what it seemed like to me, like whatever uh, device they had was shorting it out. In which it was changing different colors it's through different pixelations and i was catching all this through my night vision where it's kind of like the equipment that they had on wasn't working and it was changing so many uh, numerous colors you know like different pixels and when it went in front of her tank the driver seen it and he stepped on the brakes i hit my my my, my face on the site and he's like sarge sarge did you see that did you see it's like I was like, hell yeah, I seen that. I jump up, up, up out of the 
on top of the tank, I grabbed the pick handle because we're not allowed to have live ammunition down down uh, out there, you know, only on the, you know, when you're in the in the live ammo ranges, that's the only place, but and the, where we come from, we have no no live ammo. So I grabbed the pick handle, I jumped on and I look in and he, I, I, told, I told him, turn on the headlights. You know, I turn on the headlights, I'm in front of the tank looking, looking, I'm seeing them, I see footprints or whatever, but I couldn't see anything because the, the tank trousers are so thick that the, the dirt is like powder. So it's kind of like a tractor will have like this much dust or more because of the weight of the tanks. So if it did step, the dust just came back on it. So I wasn't able to capture a, a footprint of whatever crossed in front of the in front of the tank. So I got back on the tank. I said, close your hash, leave the lights on and let's get the hell out of here. So I got in there, put on my headset. I said, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And we took off, you know, I said, go as fast as you can. <laughs> and uh, we're going fast. We made it fast back to the mortar pool, you know, called uh, the, the people in charge to come like open the, the gate so we could put the tank in the, in the mortar pool. We put the place, the tank in the mortar pool. And we said to ourselves, I told my, my, uh, my driver, I said, hey, let's keep it to ourselves. Uh, let's keep it to ourselves so nobody can can know about what happened. We're just going to keep it amongst me and you. So that's another story that happened to me where I went into something that had some kind of cloak. I know it was no soldier because it was too tall to be a soldier. It was real tall. Was it a, a reptilian or was it new military equipment? that they were experimenting with, you know, that it was going in and out in that manner. I don't know. All I know is that we witnessed it. Uh, I'm just reminiscing right now, brothers and sisters. Uh, I hope you are enjoying the show that I'm, that I'm doing for you all right now. Uh, that's something that I'll never forget, brothers and sisters. What happened there at... On, at that range on, on uh, Fort Hood, there was another time where I was, you know, I was a uh, younger. I was a, a PFC, should a or specialist. No, it's PFC working for S three. S S three is a center of operations for the battalion. So I was driving a PC, you know, and uh, we would go set up the talk. Since so we're center of operations, all the majors. The, the, the colonels would be there, the sergeant majors, first sergeant would come and visit. You know, we always had coffee and stuff like that, soup. So my job was to be the driver, to set up the talk, and also to service the generator we had, the, the generator that gave light to the talk. Oh, well, there was, I had the night shift. I was servicing the generator. It was raining outside. I had my, my wet weather gear on. It was color green. So I'm servicing the generator, you know, putting uh, the, the mold gas in it, you know, make sure it's got oil. So I'm servicing the generator. And next thing you know, I got a flashlight. You know, it's pitch dark out there. We're set up on top of a, a mountain range. There's nothing but woods around us. So as I'm uh, servicing the generator, I hear a thump thump and thump 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 rocks are landing around me and I'm looking and I'm not seeing nobody thump 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 rocks are being thrown me out of nowhere so it's happening for a while and I'm trying I'm, I'm, I'm dodging the rocks that are being thrown me I got my Cavalier I believe one hit me on top of the my Cavalier that it bounced off you know the Cavalier is, is heavy is to protect us from bullets. Well, he hit me on top of the Cavalier and the, and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the rock that he threw was pretty big and it bounced off of me. I felt that it echoed. So I, I finished service in January. I, I ran back into the, into the tent and I thought that it was my NCO that was messing with me. So I'll go in there and I'm, and I'm upset and say, Hey, why are you messing with me? Why were you throwing rocks at me while well, servicing? The generator, I'm looking at him, and he's, he's got his cup of coffee. I said, what are you talking about? And he's not even wet. So there's no way it was him messing with me. 
but that that happened to me up there on uh it was a uh by Clabber creek on one of the range uh, uh one of the the little mountain ranges that's out there where we were set up when i worked for the s3 the following day that that happened uh the sergeant major was mad because they had 10 set up away from the talk in the, in the wall line so the sergeant major was mad and he was screaming and uh we went to find out what what was he upset about so when i went out there i said what's the matter sergeant major i said look at this i want you to see this there's a sick person that did this so i'm gonna go look there was a big pile of manure i mean a huge pile i've seen cow manure horse manure but this was a lot of manure and a big pile right by the tent you know i never seen that much that big of a pile of of crap ever in my life you know so i'm looking at it and he looks at me and say you know what you get the honor and the duty to to police this up and pick it up and take it somewhere else so I had a, I, just for asking him, he was okay. I got, well, you know, I had to follow orders and shovel that, all that manure, whatever, the, the big pile. I had to dig a hole somewhere else and take it somewhere away from the tent. You know, that's, that was my detail for the day. You know, I had already pulled the night shift. I had already got hit by a rock on the head on my Cavalier and and then that happened. I had a, I got stuck picking that up. So my question to y'all is, was it a Bigfoot? You know how people say Bigfoot throw rocks? Was it a Bigfoot that was throwing rocks? Uh, or what? Uh, or was it the Bigfoot also that left that the pile of, of manure by the tent marking its territory, the throwing of rocks, the pile of crap to let us know that it's it's territory. That's my question to y'all. This here, whoever is viewing or is going to view this video, and you can respond on it whether you're viewing it here in Spiritual Encrypted Encounters on Facebook or in Spiritual Encrypted Encounters on YouTube. The left residue, you know how people talk about spat. Well, it was more than sp it was a lot of sp it was it was a huge pile. That happened, like I said before, by Clabber Creek and one of the, the ranges there. Uh, the, the little mountain by Clabber Creek. It's so like a La Hill. It looks like a little mountain. Uh, so now I'm going to go to something a little bit different than, than, uh, than so, uh, uh, Lycanthorps and uh, Bigfoots. And I'll go back to Bigfoot in a moment. Uh, there's another time when you know as as as, as veteran as, as military personnel we go train in different areas training grounds that get set up for us just in case we go fight in the desert well we go train in the desert you know we we fight it within the woods we're training the woods so if we fight in the ice we're training the ice so the closest thing to that was Fort Owen, California, which is Fort Owen National Training Center, NTC, that we call, where we go, uh, we prepare for a week, go train two weeks, come back to the rear, turn in our equipment, and then come back home. So we was training in Fort Owen, California. This is, I'm going to share some stories from out there. How are you doing, Brother Michael Morin? So, uh... Fort Owen, California, for those who know, is near Barstow. But Barstow is probably like 50 miles away from there. Uh, so, in Fort Owen, is, you know, it's a, there's a military base there. But it's a national uh, national training center where we go train on, in the desert. That's good to hear, brother. So, we would do a lot of training out there. Uh, what, what the training we do out there is... We're, we're the the good guys and the bad guys. They have uh, tanks. Uh, at one time, they used to have M16s, F60A1s, and they were pretending to be the enemy. So, you know, we train with what we call Miles Gear, you know, where 
the it's a Miles gear. It's got Velcro around the tank. Yeah, we wear halos with Velcro. We get a vest with the uh, a halo vest or Miles gear vest. And what happens is it's all like through laser. You know, there's no ammo involved. So we have a, a little system in there where we have a key. If they kill our tank and they want to get us back in the fight, the people that are evaluating us, our training, they'll come and turn it back on and we're able to go fight, you know, because once uh, we have a little light on top of the of the tank, once that goes off and we get shot, the little light starts blinking, which means that we're, we're dead, right? The, the blinking of the light says we're dead. If we get shot, our, our gear goes off and it makes a, a weird sound, a beeping sound, and they, they have to come and stick the key and shut us off, reset us, you know? So that will happen when you're training out there. Um, what I witnessed was a couple of things that I witnessed out there. The first one was we're, we're training at nighttime and we're, we're training, we're trying to get back to the Alpha Alpha. You know, we're just pulling guard, we're training, and we're trying to get back to the Alpha Alpha. And we, we called to try to find out where we're at. We're trying to trying to see where we're at with the map, you know. With, uh, and as we're there, we're sitting there, we notice something up in the air. How are you doing, Brother David Talaga? Welcome. We're, 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 me and my TC were there. And we're, he's standing up and I'm standing up through the loader's hatch because it's hot down there. The tank gets, gets kind of hot. It's got a hydraulic system. So that gets pretty hot. All right. So I'm trying to get some fresh air because I was the gunner. So I'm out there looking at the stars because you can see all the stars. Very beautiful. Next thing we know, we see something. We see something come down and it's standing, it's looking at, it's looking at us. And it's blinking different colors, red, green, blue. And I say, do you think that's a satellite? And he's like, I've seen satellites, but they move too fast to be a satellite. So we just staying stationary, right? It's not moving. And it's changing different colors. And all of a sudden, it starts throwing a figure eight real fast. It starts moving real fast like this. And we're looking at each other and we're like, what the hell? So... It's changing different colors, but it's doing a figure eight. A figure eight. <laughs> moving real fast in the sky. Next thing you know, as it's moving, the, doing the figure eight for a while, I think it did the figure eight for about a good two minutes. It's doing the figure eight in the sky, and then it goes back out into the atmosphere. And we're thinking, what in the hell was that? The only thing we could think of was other two things. You know, we are training in the government facility, Fort Owen, California. Could have been uh, the military testing new equipment. Could have been, you know, because we do have advanced technology. Or it could have been an unidentified flying object showing itself to us. And after it showed itself to us, it took off. Either two. You figure that one out. That happened to us in Fort Orwin, California. Uh, there was another event that happened right after that. Uh, it wasn't the same gunner. It was a different gunnery. I mean, a different tra uh, different time we went to Forward Owen. Uh, me and that TC we were together for a while as a uh, uh, tank commander and, and gunner. Um, we went back out there and we were, we were moving the, in the dark. You know, what happens with, your, you, with the night vision, you can see with the night vision, but you the, the ground just looks dark in the desert. So when it looks, look, looks all dark, you don't know if there's a cliff right or a drop like a ditch or 18 foot 18 20 foot drop there's certain things out there 
that do exist like that, cracks in the, natural cracks in the earth. Uh, then uh, we call them wadis. So we're driving, right? We go, we're driving the tank, and I'm going to sit in my gunner seat, and I see an image of something. I see the image of something, and, and my spirit tells me, traverse the turret left. So as I traverse the turret left, my T says, what are you doing? As I traverse in the turret left, our tank goes sideways. Oof. As we go sideways, we're sideways, right? We're sideways in the tank. And I'm sitting, I'm the gunner, I'm sitting on the gun tube. That's how bad we are sideways. Uh, my TC is by the wall the, and the loader by the wall. You know, and my TC tried to jump off and I grabbed him and pulled it in because when you're fixing to have a tank rollover, you can't jump out because the, the tank will squat you. So I grabbed him and pulled him back in. And the driver's scared, and he's got the his brakes. He's holding on the brakes. I told him to put on the parking brake. So we're sideways. We don't know if we're going to flip or not. All I know is when that happened, my driver, you know, he was still, he was bare, he was new. He was kind of, you could say, crying because he was, he was scared. And I told him, I was trying to calm him down. I was trying to calm him down. And I say, hey, don't think about that. Just, just keep on holding it. You're doing good. And I was trying to keep everybody, everybody calm. And you know, we we called through through our communications to get help. You know, and they couldn't see us. So they told us to turn on the lights. So you know, they told us to turn on the lights. And but before that happened, they were turning on the lights. Something happened, brothers and sisters. As we're sideways and we didn't know we we're going to flip over into off a cliff into a 20 foot drop, 10 foot drop. We heard a, we heard a woman crying. You know, when you heard about the Yorona, we heard a woman crying around the tank. She was crying around the tank, <laughs> the driver was already scared, and he was like, what the fuck is that, Sarge? I said, don't worry about it. Why is she crying? And, <laughs> and then the, the, the loader was scared, and the, my TC was freaked out because we're out in the middle of nowhere in the desert training, and we're hearing a woman crying. You know, when you hear tales of the Yorona, they're cr crying or death, whatever it was that was out there, he was crying. He was going around the tank, crying. He was crying around the tank to where the driver was. He was roaming us. He was going around us, crying around the tank. That's how scary it was. You know that if it was a crying in the distance, but no, he was crying and roaming around us. You know, he was crying, roaming like could have been a crying death. Is there such thing as a crying death that something's fixing to happen, right? So I was crying around us. So I start praying the Our Father, Our Father, Lord in Heaven. Start praying. Next thing you know, we got a call to turn on our headlights. We turn on our headlights, and they finally see us. So we we got got our, our, our one of our tank, one of our friend uh, Robinson. He came banging our tank with a Cavalier, and they say, "Hey, I got you hooked up. To, I'm going to hook you up to my tow strap." We have a, a long tow strap cable, long cable tow strap where we pull tanks if they need to get pulled. But he he hooked it up and put the way he hooked it up to his tank and he said, look, if we all flip, we're all going to flip. He said, but I'm not going to let you all flip. So he put tension on it so we wouldn't be able to flip. So we had to wait for for the for the, the people that train us to come. So they had a bunch of lights on there and. When we got off the tank, they told us to come on out. We were sliding off the tank like a slide, right? It's still nighttime. We can't see. Every, every, you know, everybody's scared because of what happened. You know, that we're going to flip over. The crying of the woman that was going around the tank. Uh, next thing you know, uh, all that happened. Following day when the sun rose, 
we seen the situation what had happened where there's a 20 foot drop to the left of us the only thing that was really holding us up before they came with a toe strap was my gun tube that my instincts told me to turn traverse left the gun tube got stuck in the sand so our tracks fell off when we had to bring it down our tracks busted so we had a when we we, we took it all the way down there was a the, the 88s came to help us to take it all the way down to the 20 foot drop but if we would have dropped somebody would have died so i thank god that, that nothing happened to anybody but the only uh, the only thing that holds us up that evening was a gun tube when i follow my instincts that it told me to turn left at that time that it turned left the tank almost flipped the gun tube was full of sand we opened the breach where the main gun rounds there's nothing but sand in there we had to take all that out but that's what saved us uh, from flipping over and from people dying uh, this happened in north fort Owen, california training center Another thing happened out there, you know, there's a lot of coyotes. You know, when we talk about desert coyotes and we think about possible skinwalkers, shapeshifters. Uh, there was another time we were still training out there and they say, hey, we're going to get some rest. Everybody get some rest. So everybody's asleep in their, in their tanks and I'm asleep on the back deck of my tank and I uh, hear like like water drops and I, I'm thinking it's fixing to rain on us. You know, we're in the desert and I can hear water drops hitting, hitting my, my sleeping bag. So as I'm hearing this, I uh, open up my sleeping bag and I, and I get out of my sleeping bag and I'm looking. There's no water drops. But when I look, what I see and what I witness, I look like this all around me, all around me, brothers and sisters. The only thing I could see in a circle formation around us was nothing but wolves slash coyotes flanked all the way around our tank. And in the middle, there was what I believe to be the alpha, was an all black uh, wolf slash coyote looking at us. So I'm looking at it, it's looking at me and the eyes are kind of freaked out, they're kind of like yellowish reddish in between and it's looking at me it's kind of like the whole pack is surrounded us already so i guess i don't know if there was waiting for the order of the alpha to attack so what i did is i urinated around the tank i urinated around the tank from on top of the tank to mark my territory to let them know is let them know this is my territory when i did that they turned around and they all walked away i'm glad i did that you know that's something i learned from uh, watching the show back in the day uh, i can't remember the name of the show but there was this it was dealing is dealing with this this old man and a guy that they would go uh hunting for, for, for wild animals like raccoons and uh, uh, what do you call them, banshees, wolverines. I can remember the show Omaha or Mutual Omaha. I can remember the name of the show on top of my head, but it was an old show back from the 70s. And I learned that from that show and I did that and it worked. <laughs> uh, I marked my territory and whatever it was, the coyotes, wolves or they were skinwalkers, whatever they were, they left uh, the tank, you know. Uh, but that experience that in Fort Orwin, California also. Uh, that's an experience from Fort Orwin, California when I served the United States Army. I don't wanna, I don't know what time it is right now. Yeah, it was, it was brother, uh, brother Michael. There were so many of them, man. There was four, four in a crew, and man, that you you know how big a tank is. When I looked all around me, they were all around us, all around us. There wasn't just like 
what I was looking, they were all around the tank. It had to be, I would say, like 60 to 70 strong, man, out there surrounding us, surrounded the tank. You know, uh, it was there was a lot of them because I looked all the way around and my crew was asleep. So if they would have decided to attack, they could have, right? And I, I would have been able to sell myself because I would have been able to jump inside the tank. But the people that were asleep, you know, they wouldn't have been able to save themselves. So what I did, I marked the territory to protect them, you know, and, you know, and I woke them up from it. You know, I woke up my, 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 my uh, tank commander was a heavy sleeper. So I tried to wake him up and he wouldn't wake up. So you could say I was the only one that witnessed this. So when they finally did wake up, they were like, what, what the hell's going on? You know, they're trying to figure out what's going on. And I told them what happened. I wish I would have witnessed what I witnessed. And I've been, I've, I've trained in Fort Orange, California for numerous years. I was in the cab for eight years. So that was where we go train. In Germany, I would go train in Grafinger and Holmfels. Those are training grounds. But that was the first time I ever witnessed something like that. That many, that, that big of a pack being controlled by one that was all black, like an alpha. There's a, the only time that I witnessed that, because uh, there's coyotes out there, and the coyotes, they roam around the Dust Bowl uh, looking for food, you know. Uh, they're, they're roaming around. There's a lot of coyotes out there. But this pack was, was pretty big, man. Uh, I'll never forget that. That's why I'm sharing it with y'all here right now on uh, Spiritual Encrypted Encounters. I'm sharing stories at SARNCS today, you know, as you can see. I got my tanker shirt here. Brand new tanker shirt I bought from a buddy that is a uh, retired first sergeant. Me and him were sergeants was uh, in the military. I didn't get to retire because I, I got injured, but he retired as a first sergeant. And he makes this beautiful army shirts that I buy from him, you know. So I purchased this from him and I placed it on. You can see the, the tank right there. The M1, A2, A3, however numbers it is now. Abrams tank. Uh, I bought it from him, and I, I make, I'm sharing the stories here for whoever wants to enjoy the stories. Um, I could talk about the time where <clears throat> I've already shared quite a bit of incidents that happened there in Fort Orwin, California. Uh, I, and that's why I got the, I was in an accident, man. It's, it's a very, that's the, the worst training place to train when you when you go there they have a board of all the casualties that happen during training where people have died there so when you go there you can't play it safe you have to be with your guards up what happened is is when we train we train a lot of hours sometimes there's days that we go without sleep so when fatigue starts hitting you that's when the accident happened you know there's people that have, what almost happened to me going into that, uh, the, the Wadi, people, the people, platoons have run into those Wadis where the whole platoon will die or, or fall or they fall off a cliff, a mountain range and, at nighttime and they die, you know. So there's been a lot of people that have done training in Fort Worth or in California. It is a very dangerous place. You know, so it's like when you go there, you really have to get to sleep when you get it. The, when you have a chance to get some sleep, get it. You you have to eat properly, but you know, because the two weeks that we train is very realistic. Almost as realistic as being in combat. You know, uh, like for example, sleep wise, you no, know, they'll, they'll say, okay, we're going to go 100% tonight. 100% uh, means the whole crew is awake. They'll tell you, okay, we're going to go 75%, which means three up, one one gets some rest for a little while, and, and you rotate. 50% is, you know, 50-50. Two sleeping, and two, they alternate. 
and, and still somebody's got to pull guard, you know. Whatever percentage you tell you, you got to be, there's still got to be people pulling guard. And that's how it is. It's, uh, you don't know, brothers and sisters, whoever doesn't know about the military, how much stuff as, as soldiers we train, we train, and we train, and we train to become first in nature, you know. Uh, they, they put, invest a lot of money in us to be the best of the best, uh, and they train us in every way possible, offensively, defensively, and, you know, when you train that, that way, like I'm speaking to you all tonight, it's Sergeant Sias. Sergeant Sias is always going to be Sergeant Sias. Just like anybody else that served, they're going to hold whatever less ranked ahead for the rest of their lives because of the training we do is that intense. And when it's intense like that, you never forget of what you witness when you go training uh, in, the, in the training uh, places. And I've said quite a bit of stories to y'all. I'm going to share another a spiritual story with y'all now at SRNCS that happened to me on Fort Hood. I was pulling CQ and I told my, so I told my soldier, look, I'm going to go home, go get something to eat. You're in charge till I come back. If somebody asks where I'm at, tell them I'm, I'm uh, patrolling the area. You know, uh, I'm going to go home, give me something to eat. So I'm driving home. I'm in, I'm in my in my uh, in my military gear. I'll show it to y'all one more time, uh, brothers and sisters. Here's my old ID when I was a sergeant in the military. This is how the were our, the IDs were back in the day. That's me, Sergeant C is right there. This is this is my. VA card, you see me right there. I'm just showing this because sometimes people try to say that you're not what you say you are. So I'm showing you all this, that I'm true. Uh, who, the stories I'm sharing, sharing to y'all are true. I am a veteran of the United States Army. And I also have my DD-214. My DD-214, the states, it's an official government document that states where I've been, when I joined the military, when I left the military. It shows all my, my rank. It shows all my, my ribbons, where I've been in combat. That's a DD-214. And I'm showing it to y'all because there is people within the crypto community that have come up against me and stolen some of my, my stories. What they've done is cut certain things that I say and then they falsify themselves falsified like they falsified saying that I that I threatened them that I was going to hurt them in some kind of way because they just took the recording of what I said but they didn't say the whole story of what I was talking about uh, when they said that that I shot something somebody between the eyes that happened in Operation Desert Storm you know uh, with my personal 9 mail. They only took the, that part of me saying that I was going to shoot somebody, that I shot somebody in between the eyes. And they, then they said, they, go, they went off and said that I was threatening, threatening them. And they took the part of when I said that I ran over somebody with a tank, saying that I was going to run over them with a tank to, the, uh, to give me a bad reputation, you know. That's why I'm making this video right now. I'm showing them my proof. You no, know, they said they had a marine, a marine, uh, a marine, uh, a person that was a marine in their shadow. Can you show the proof that that individual was actually a marine? Uh, show me the proof. I'm showing you the proof of who I am. Here you go. Sergeant Sias, that's me right there. I was around... 25, 26 years old in this picture. United States Army. That's an identification card. Here's the proof. 
um, a veteran, uh, a disabled veteran. There's VA with the flag, American flag. That's me right here. Brother Abe Sias, Army veteran. And I got my DD 214 right here. It says where I've been when I joined, when I left the military. So, for the people that stole my stories and only took certain parts out of it, certain context, and took it out of context, I done showed you my proof that I am who I say I am. And what you did of stealing, taking my stories out of context wasn't good. That's, that's, that, wasn't, that wasn't good at all. Trying to <clears throat> give me a bad reputation when I probably served as a soldier. I probably served the Uni United States Army with heroism and valor. So you said y'all had a Marine on your show. Just, just like what I showed y'all right now. If it's a true Marine, huh? Who? I got cousins that are true Marines. I got cousins that were in the Navy. I got brother that was in the Navy. I got f family that was in, in the Army like me. If you're a true Marine, show me what I just showed you. Show me your car. Show me your identification. You say you're a true Marine. You ain't gonna be ashamed to show who you are. I'm not ashamed to show who I am, and I'm not afraid to, to share the stories of what I've been through in the military. That's why I'm doing this. Sorry about this, guys, that I'm saying this right now, uh, but that's what happened. You know, they twisted some stuff, trying to say that Sarncias was threatening their family, that they were scared of life. They took certain parts of my video out of context intentionally. They're trying to give me a bad rep. You know, I have no reason to lie who I am. I just, uh, I showed, what I just showed now, I showed at the beginning of the show. So people can know that I'm the real deal. And I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't, I don't lie. I'm showing y'all who I've been and what I've done. You know, maybe another day I'll show you my, my archives, uh, my, my words from when I was in combat, you know. But I think with the proof that I've shown y'all right now, that's enough proof. If they don't believe me, I went out to the, I was in the Battle of Medina Ridge. I have an ARCOM that says exactly where I've, where I've been, that I was in the Battle of Medina Ridge. But anyways, let's go back to the stories. That's why I'm making this video. I'm going to share one more story with y'all. And I'm going to go back to the story I was talking to y'all about. I was going home. I was going home. To go eat. When I was going home, I heard a voice of a girl say, help me. At that time, there was a girl that had gotten abducted from an elementary school. I heard a voice say, help me. So I started following my spiritual instinct and I started driving following my senses to see where my senses would take me. As I was following my senses, it took me down these back roads. And as I was following these, uh, these back roads, it was getting dark. And then I said, well, maybe it's just my imagination that it's this girl that's calling my name spiritually for help, right? So I stop and I turn around. Why I stop, I'm looking and see if I can sense anything anymore. And my, my senses are going crazy. So I stop. I get back in the vehicle. And I go back home to get something to eat. And I go back and, and do my 24-hour duty. I go, when I wake up uh, in the morning, I go get some sleep. I wake up. Because normally when you pull a 24-hour duty, <clears throat> they give you a day off the following day. I do Brother Daniel. Uh, <clears throat> so when I wake up, I say, you know what? Let me go back <clears throat> to this road where, because I said that they have found the bot, they have found the girl, they have found the remains of the girl. You know, the news when I woke up said they have found remains of the girl. 
So I got in the vehicle and I followed the road. They said they had found the, the remains of the girl by the land passage river. So as I was following the road to see where it led the night before, it led to the land passage river, to the location where the girl that was calling for help was. God rest her soul. But the way she got killed was very, how should I say, horrific. Whoever killed her chopped her up into tiny pieces, brothers and sisters. That's how this elementary girl died. And till this day, as far as I know, they never found her, the killers. They never found who did that to her. So somewhere here in Central Texas, there's a serial killer that killed that girl. You know, there's so many, so many that have disappeared and that died uh, in Central Texas in this manner. Uh, you know, it's like when, when you experience something like that, you're like, whoa, her spirit was calling me. I was there, you know, this, I've always been spiritually gifted in this manner. <clears throat> but it's, 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 I'll give you an, <clears throat> another story. When, when I lived, uh, I had bought a house. I bought a house. I said, because I got tired of renting, hearing the neighbors right beside you making all kinds of noise. So I bought a house in Heather Glen area, which is down Stan Schluter. I bought a house there. I seen it get built from the ground up. You know, I was a veteran. I mean, not a veteran. I was in the military as a sergeant. Boom. A nice house and everything. Uh, I think I was only paying like 550 a month for a... It was one, see, three bedroom, a, a, a day room. It was a two story, two car garage, three, two and a half bath house. So for a sergeant, I was doing pretty good, right? I seen the house get built from the ground up. So I was happy. Till, <laughs> I was happy and there's always a till. Right? Till certain things started happening around the house. I will give you some examples of it. I have a chimney, a brick chimney, and I'm sitting in my living room. And out of the chimney, you hear what seems to sound to be a baby crying. Then I said to myself, that's a cat. Or is it a baby? And I just said, you know what, I'm just going to leave it at, it's a cat. Strange events started happening. Doorbell starts ringing by itself. Open the door, nobody's there. Knocking start happening. You open the door, nobody's there. Knocking on the back, on the back uh, sliding door, nobody there. Scratches on the windows, nobody there. So I start witnessing these things. Then my nephews, you know, they were young. They were staying upstairs. So I was helping out my sister. And they came running from down from the upstairs, scared, saying that they saw two children on the second floor window knocking on the window, calling them to come outside. Right? And they were scared, and I could see they were scared. I go outside, I don't see nobody. And I said to myself, well, maybe just coincidental. Then certain things start happening to me. Where I am in my room and I see somebody standing right beside me in the room. I get up, turn on the light, there's nobody there. Turn off the light, I can still see what seems to be like a female standing right beside me. I turn on the light, nobody there. I left it at that. Uh, one evening, I'm asleep. So it's kind of like I'm in between 
reality and the dream world. And I'm seeing myself asleep on the bed. So what I witnessed as I'm in between, I witnessed a, what seemed to be like a girl, probably like 13, 14 years old with a native dress on. Uh, her mouth is open and her eyes are rolled back like if she's drowned, right? So she goes crawling on the bed and scratches my back. When I wake up out of the uh, out of the sleep, I was like, "Whoa, that was a crazy dream." I get up. I have company over. My cousins came to visit from from another town, so they're sitting in the in the in the kitchen with my sister. So I go in there without my shirt, and I go get me a drink of water. As I'm getting the drink of water, they all say, "Hey." What happened to your back? It's like, what do you mean? And they take a picture of my back. I have a scratch three, all down my back. So I said to myself, is it something real that I'm seeing? Or is it just coincidental? My neighbor was smoking a cigarette outside one evening. And he's just smoking it. And I said, are you okay, man? It seems like you're scared or something over there. He said, if I tell you this, you, you're not, you're not going to make fun of me, are you? I said, well, d just tell me what it is and we'll talk about it. So, well, you know how I converted my garage into a den and I made it into a library. Well, I was doing some my, my work, you know, I was, I was doing some work there my, through my computer. I went and got up to go drink some water. I was drinking some water and I came back. When I came back to enter the the my little library den, there was a Indian girl sitting in the middle of my den looking at me. And I said, how's your look? He said, she's got a, a brown, she had like a brown dress, her mouth was open and her eyes were like white. And I said, I believe you. And he said, you do? So yeah, because I've seen her in my house too. So what I did after numerous activities, there was one where I took a picture of a raccoon. There was a raccoon on my, on my barbecue pit. Not that I was trying to cook it. It was on my barbecue. So I took a picture of the, of the raccoon through the, through the sliding door. When the picture came out, you could see the raccoon on the, on the barbecue pit, but you could see a native, a native Indian or what seems to be a native Indian, standing by the raccoon. So, was it, this is a question for y'all, was it a native spirit, or was it a, a possible shapeshifter, and when I took the picture, it showed its true identity, but it was both that came out in the picture, the raccoon and the native. I wish I would have the picture. Uh, when I all this started, all these things were happening. I said, you know what? I called them up. I told them, y'all can come get your house. I don't want it no more. So I gave it back to them. After there was enough evidence for me to get out of there. But then I went up in Elms Grove, and then y'all know what what happened in Elms Grove. But I think Sarcias has spoken enough. I hope you all enjoyed the stories. Uh, let me see what time it is. Well, it's almost going to be... I'll talk a little... I hope you all enjoyed the stories. You know, and I still have more stories that I want to share with you all. But I hope you all enjoyed the stories of when I was in the military. Uh, we, uh, I'll be honest with you, you know. Uh... The jobs, when we raise the right hand, the jobs that we, we, we fulfill in the military, especially the job of a, as a tanker in the United States Army, that job is a high percentage of dying. Whether you die in training or you die in combat in the front lines. It's not a, an easy job. I did it for 10 years. 
And to all my brothers in arms that served their 20 years or more, I had some that were retired first sergeants and retired sergeant majors that, that served with me. We were the same rank when I was a sergeant. My hat's, my hat's off to them, you know, uh, they served, they got to retire and I'm happy for them. Uh, me, I just wound up getting hurt and couldn't do, do all my time. But I hope you all enjoyed the stories, true stories from Sarnsias. Sarnsias can be hardcore. Sarnsias can be many things. But one thing the Sarnsias always did was training soldiers to the highest level to be ready for combat. Not to be afraid, but to be ready to face the enemy and try to get them tough to the best of his abilities, for them not to have fear, but to train them to be first in nature. You know, because I knew that as sick as I was, I was eventually gonna leave and they were going to stay, so I wanted to train, at, train them to the fullest to prepare them for combat. When I left the military, I ran into some of them that went to combat. They recognized me, they came up to me, and they started crying. Sergeant Sias said, out of all the people that were around us, training us, you're the only one that was speaking of truth. Everybody was making you sound like you were crazy but you knew what you were talking about. You was getting us prepared what was to come. We witnessed and experienced what you ex experienced in common and they started crying because now they have to live with that for the rest of their lives, such as what I have to live for the rest of my life, which is the experiences and the memories of combat, which is not good because in combat, there's people that live and there's people that die. And we have to live with that for the rest of our lives. So, for all these people that are taking things out of context, screw you, uh, stolen valor. You're not going to steal my thunder or where I've been and what I've done. I've done showed you who I am. Wh I've showed you. Now show me of the Marine you had in your show that you said it was a Marine or was he just pretending a Marine? He was a real Marine and he's proud of his service, time and duty of service. He's going to show me that he's truly a Marine. And if he's truly a Marine, I will honor him. But if he's not a real Marine, then he's stolen valor, which means that what you place in your show is fake material, fake people, fake stories. That's RNC is sending off here from Spiritual Encrypted Encounters. If you see a Marine or somebody wearing that has served the United States Army proudly, thank them. Tell them thank you. It means a lot because a lot of these Marine, a lot of these soldiers, they're suffering from injuries, ailments, PTSD. When you thank them, it feels good within their heart because it's showing that people care of the sacrifices they've done for the United States of America. This is Sergeant Sia signing off here for Spiritual Character Encounters. If you like Sergeant Sia saying military stories, let Brother Spiritual Ape see us know and he'll bring Sergeant Sia more often into his shows. Everybody have a beautiful, blessed evening. God bless every single one of y'all.